Welcome, First Presbyterian Church here in Taylorville. Uh, any announcements from the congregation? Just talk louder if you want me to. Let me know. Uh, the only uh, announcements we have in the bulletin looks like uh, Harmony's got their uh, concert on August 11th at 11 p.m. on Saturday, and on August 12th at 4 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday. Oh, excuse me. Okay. I didn't, oh, I see Friday and Saturday. Okay, Friday and Saturday. Excuse me. Uh, also, the bathroom downstairs is done. So. So everybody knows that by now. And uh, see here. That's about it, I guess. So.
you stand that's able and join with me in the call to worship? Weeds and seeds growing together, each will influence the other. What will we learn from the weeds? Trials and tribulations, choices that have not always worked out. Weeds can teach us about perseverance, consider the tough dandelion plant, pushing its way up through the pavement. For some, it's just a weed, but for others, there are lessons to be learned. What will be gained from seeds? Inside each one of us is a special person waiting to be nurtured to the wholeness. Each seed is unique. Each has his own gift to offer. In God's garden, God's love extends to both, asking both to consider what each has to offer to a hurting world. Lord, help us be good seeds, bearing fruits of kindness, justice, and compassion. Keep us mindful of those for whom life has been difficult, and yet they persist in trying to make each day better. Be in our hearts, O Lord, and in our lives. Amen. We are such a ragtag group of people. Some of us are at the top of our game and others just struggle to get through each day. Yet you draw us here where we find friendship, peace, and hope, not only for our lives right now, but for all the time to come. Stand us up again, O God. Dust us off and put us back on the paths of service and reconciliation. Warm our hearts with your love. Lift our spirits with your power, for we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Please turn down your hymnals to page 401, verses 1, 2, and 4, here in this place. he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The Lord redeems the life of his servant. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. 
second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 13, page 959. If I speak in the tongues of men of uh, angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patience and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the love. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatness of these is love. It's good to be back with you. I don't know what I enjoy more. Coming here to worship with you. Or going downstairs and eating donuts and hearing all your stories. And I, I don't say that to poke fun. It's just... <clears throat> We live in a world where we talk about love, but we don't often see it put into practice. And the love that I experience when I go down and have those coffee and donuts, may I say the donuts don't necessarily love me. Yep, the warranty's gone out. It's good to be with you. And the scripture lesson for today is about love. And when I first looked at this lesson, the thoughts that came to my mind were, this is one of the most over-preached passages in the whole Bible. You can't have a wedding without somebody reciting this. Sometimes you can't have a funeral without somebody reciting it. And the whole Valentine's Day industry. I was looking at the calendar as I was preparing for today. And it says that it's Parents' Day. Well, you know, our politically correct world has struck again. We've got Mother's Day and Father's Day, and now let's tie it all together in a neat bow. Parents' Day. It's a conspiracy from Hallmark Cards, I'm almost sure, and I wouldn't be surprised if American Greetings was also very much in favor. But personally for me, this is a Parents' Day, Today is the 38th birthday of my daughter, Katie. You may remember, Katie visited here once. I had had some tooth surgery, and they were giving me drugs. That meant I couldn't drive. And, oh, she was fun to ride with. 
I have a lot of memories of birthdays and time. And it was very interesting. I remember one time a guy I was working with said, What kind of a man are you? All you got was daughters. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, First off, I never ask God for sons and daughters. I ask God for healthy children. And he's answered that prayer. Second, the choice of whether it's a boy or a girl is with the male. Read about it in your biology textbooks. Well, I don't know that I won the argument, but at least he kept quiet after that. And I really believe that God has blessed me. One other thing that has happened this last week. My younger daughter, Margaret, she and her husband of five years. That's right, Saturday is the anniversary. I hope I have a card. <laughs> anyway, um, they got a golden retriever puppy this week. And it's fun to watch them train it particularly because I was raised in the generation of, oh, yes, Daddy, yes, yes, we'll take care of the dog. We'll, yes, yes, please. Who took care of the dog? Dad. Well, I live far enough away, that won't happen. And I've been watching Margaret and her husband, Mike, train this 10-week-old purebred puppy cute little thing. They're calling her Moose. He said, oh yeah, she'll get to be about 70 pounds when she's full grown. And I'm thinking, I want to know what dog food company you're purchasing from because I want to get stock because their stock's going to go up. But you know, it's fun to watch Puppy parents try to train their dogs, particularly number one and number two are outside. And it, it has been a joy to watch. If you ever go to an art gallery and you see medieval paintings, many of them are of husbands and wives, and there's always a dog at their feet. The name of the dog is usually Fido, from which we get the word fidelity, faithfulness. And so if you have a picture of a husband and wife with the dog, that means there's faithful love in that family. And we're talking about love. It's an inexhaustible subject, I can guarantee you that. If you don't believe that, go to any used bookstore. And the largest collection they're trying to sell for usually 25 cents or less a copy, Harlequin Romances. Uh, the old book barn up in Forsyth has a whole room that's wall to wall to wall, floor to ceiling of gently used Harlequin romances. Now either someone isn't romantic anymore and is getting rid of them, or there's some kids that are like, we got to get a pickup truck. We got to get this stuff out of mom's house. <laughs> Love is everywhere. And as we look at the very last sentence of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, I will show you a still more excellent way.
which is then the introduction to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And he's t the whole chapter, of course, is about love. But if you look at the context, some of those folks in Corinth were not feeling very loving. There was all sorts of internal strife in that church and arguing, like the old uh, joke about the church meeting, the church annual meeting. You wouldn't see a better fight in 15 rounds. No, that's not original with me. It came from a Southern Baptist. So you can't blame me for that one. I'm just quoting. But Paul has been writing to this church. These people that he loves, he worked in this community. He brought many of them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and he has patiently taught them how to live for Jesus Christ. Except they can't agree on how they're to live for Jesus Christ. We do it this way. No, we do it that way. We do it this What a mess. And so finally, somebody gets the courage up and writes to Paul and explains what's going on. And Paul writes several letters back, and we have two of them as a part of Holy Scripture. And they've been arguing about the gifts that they have in the church. Praise the Lord, God gives each of us gifts. Some are real good at singing. Some are real good at counting. Every one of us has a gift that can be used in the church, and that's something we celebrate. But for some reason, they were arguing instead. And it was petty stuff. My Bible's bigger than your Bible. Did you ever have that one happen when you were in third grade Sunday school? It was even worse when they had those Sunday school um, attendance emphasis months. And the one was, see who can bring the smallest Bible. And of course, you know, all the little kids are getting those little scripture things, you know, little pocket things. No, no, it's got to be the entire Bible. Well, finally, someone walks in with a Gideon Bible that is the whole Bible and is the smallest print known to mankind and wins the prize. And then they have the biggest Bible, and so every grandparent is going into the attic to get the old family Bible that is pretty decrepit. The binding's broken. They've wrapped it in saran wrap so it won't fall apart. See, mine's bigger. Well, that's because it's large print. Your eyes are going. I shouldn't make fun of that because mine are. People say, why do you use the Bible you use for preaching? Large print. And the arguing goes on. And where there should be holiness of heart, pure, perfect love, there is animosity. Well, God gave me this gift, so I'm better than you. <clears throat> it doesn't work that way, says Paul. You have to love one another, regardless. 
And so after he discusses um, the various gifts and the order of them, he steps outside the argument for a minute and he says, let me show you a still more excellent way. Now, the fun part we have with 1 Corinthians 13 is our English translations only use the word love. The Greeks had five words for love. And I'll be honest, this has been a busy enough week, I couldn't look to see how many of them were used in this passage. But of course, we all know about agape love, that's godly love, uh, God's love for us, and the love that we show to others. There's phileo, and you thought that was just a brand of cream cheese, brotherly love. There's eros. That's the sexual one, and you know you have to be very careful how you talk about that. You know, polite society. There's store day, which is kind of like love for a coworker, and caritas, charity. All that's wrapped up in one English word. And I believe that um, William Tyndale and um, John Wycliffe and the, um, the translators of the Geneva Bible and the King James probably scratched their head a lot about this passage. Because there's all these different words for love, and the English only has one. Well, I don't want to bore you with Greek lessons. When I finished studying Greek in seminary, I thanked the professor for his mercy. But Paul is trying to explain here you want to live for Jesus Christ, you have to have love. And he starts out by saying what love is not. It's not the tongues of humans or angels. And if you have those tongues, you might as well be a symbol in a brass band. Love is not prophecy. And if you do prophesy without love, it's not really a good thing. Um... If I give everything away, but I don't do it out of love, it's boasting. I learned this at an early age from my grandmother. You know, we live in an age where if you got money and you want to be remembered for eternity, you give it to an organization and they name a building after you. Only once did that backfire. At the University of Kansas, um, they built a new physics building and it was named after the benefactor. Unfortunately, the stone that they used to build the building had some magnetite in it. And you know how physics people are with their meters and things. Every physics experiment they did went haywire. They ended up having to tear the building down after like three years. But, you know, 
If we boast, we don't have love. Love isn't in what we say or what we proclaim or what we give. Oh, sure, you can give out of love. Nothing wrong with that. You can tell somebody something out of love. Nothing wrong with that. But we've all met people who were very gifted but didn't have love. Early in my ministry, I went to um, a church growth conference. It was in this country church out in uh, southeast Ohio. The church had been running on a good Sunday, 20 They got a new pastor, and within a year and a half, they were running 750. So, he felt like he knew how to talk about church growth. Well, it was a hurting community, a lot of unemployment. They definitely needed to hear good news. So, I went to this conference, and when I heard him speak, Oh, he's a good speaker. But there was no love in his voice. The reason your churches aren't growing is you're not working hard enough. And he went on chapter and verse of how many hours we needed to spend. And, you know, we only got seven 24-hour days in a week. He was acting like there was eight or nine, and why were we sitting here? (laughs) Took me a few years to figure out, okay, good speaker, prophetic, no love. (laughs) And it broke my heart, because the man left town several years later, with the federal authorities following close behind. He'd started his own school. I've seen toilet paper that was of more value than his diplomas. And I think he's in Iowa now, but I don't want to hold that against the state. But there was no love. The man harangued us. Like he had all the answers. And there are several people who are now saying, why did we ever appoint him? Uh, It was a sad story. But Paul is saying love is not all these gifts if you use them in the wrong way. And then... We have the contrast, because the next verses, 4 through 7, talk about love. what love is. Patient, kind, not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. Does not insist on his own way. Is not irritable or resentful. Doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. Rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is love. And you know, some of the people who practice it the best, if you said, oh, you're so loving, they'd probably respond, who, me? No. Love is patient. When you're stuck in that traffic jam trying to get to the Cardinal game and you know you'll probably have to park in East St. Louis to get a decent parking space, that's patience. Love is kind. 
Back to the puppy training. When the puppy does an accident on your deep, plush pile carpet, do you get out the cleaning supplies or do you kick that dog through the front door? Okay, I understand. I've been there. I stepped in it. Oh, that was, I'm getting off subject. Love is an envious, boastful, arrogant, rude guy I went to college with, third generation minister. We were talking about his grandfather, who was a noted evangelist. He said, well, my grandfather may have said he had perfect love. He treated my grandmother like dirt. And I was like, wait a minute. You want perfect love, it's got to be in all things. <laughs> not irritable, not resentful. Doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. You know, our entire publishing industry would go bankrupt if we didn't have mystery novels full of revenge. Wrongdoing. We rejoice in the truth. Sometimes that's hard. But love helps us to bear it, to believe, to hope, to endure. When I was in college, one of the retired pastors in town had a book sale. Now, if you're thinking about going in the ministry, and you're in a town with a lot of retired pastors, when they have a book sale... You go. And I went to one in particular. I think I bought, I don't know, $5 worth of books. One of them was 1,001 Evangelistic Sermon Illustrations. Come to find out, there weren't many of those books in the college library, and if you took the preaching course, you had to have illustrations. And I had a book. The bad news was there was not an illustration in it that was newer than 1901. Not real good for a contemporary sermon. But as I read through it, there were half a dozen stories of women who were found in the Bowery in very poor health and taken to the hospital and when they were asked, what are you doing down there? I'm looking for my son. He's been gone for 12, or fill in the blank, how many years. And I know he's in one of these bars. And I want him to know I still love him. Of course, the idea with the sermon illustration was, if mom loves her son that much, how much more does God love us? But if I shared that in a preaching class, most of the people wouldn't know what the Bowery was. But it was that whole idea of enduring love. And then Paul wraps it up by saying, love never ends. Each of us somewhere has a keepsake box where we keep some of our special things. In my keepsake box are probably a dozen letters from my grandmother who was a spiritual giant in my life, even though I 
don't think she was over 5'1". But she was always writing encouraging letters, letting me know she loved me and she was praying for me. Uh, she died in 1993. But I read those letters and they're just as fresh as the day I got them. That love doesn't end. How much more does God's love not end? Things end. Paul says prophecies end. Knowledge ends. For those of you that are related to librarians, you're like, ooh, that's not nice. Um, we only know part of the story, so we can only tell part of the story, but that's going to end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. Now I'm an adult and put an end to childish ways. You know when I found out I was an adult? It was the year that for my birthday, I was given a toolbox. And in the card was this verse. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. I think my parents are trying to tell me something. Love doesn't end. There are things in our human life that end. Or we can't see through them. They're like a dim mirror. And we have the three. Faith, hope, love. And the greatest is love. But don't you hate it when there's a but? But to be honest, we talk an awful lot about love. I mean, it's a multi-million dollar industry. Without love, where would Fannie Mae Candies be? Where would all the green cards be? Paul goes on from here and he talks more about spiritual gifts than about the coming of our Lord. But the crux of this is if you are not loving God and loving others, you're wasting your time. I come from a rather unemotive family. I used to joke, we're not sure that God smiles. Well, God does smile, so we got that argument taken care of. But one of the hardest things for me growing up, I knew... My parents loved me, had no doubt. But it was never said. I remember when I was in seminary, I was reading about this, and I thought, I'm going to try something. Next time I talked to my parents at the end of the phone call, I said, well, you guys have a good day. I love you. And I get this, uh oh. Yeah, we love you too. Bye. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that my parents didn't love me. But they had been raised in families where you just didn't say the word. I'm still trying to figure that out. But my wife and I are having a field day with it. Because, you know, when we talk to our girls, love you, love you, you know, and they love it. Talk to my folks, end of the phone conversation. Well, we'll talk to you again. Love you. Uh, oh, yeah, love you too. I'm 
not trying to make fun of my parents. They just came from a family that was not expressive. Which has been fun for me because I married a very expressive woman. And I'm so thankful I did because she saved my bacon more times than I can count. Something will be going on and I'm not sure how to respond and I'll go, I see how she's responding. Go, ah. And I've thanked God many times for that. But we are called to love show a more excellent way. That's hard. Because we live in an unloving world. You don't believe that? Drive down the I-55. And somebody cuts you off. What is your first thought? God bless you. I love you. No. I had to stop using my horn because God convicted me that I was using it in place of some rather unsavory responses. And I have felt a real healing for that. But Paul is saying here, if you want to serve Jesus Christ, love him and love others. Major on the things you have in common. <laughs> 